Chapter 3 Road of the Dead The huge armoured MRAP led the caravan as it made its way along the abandoned roadway through the chill night. Jonas and Kurt both rode inside, protected from the crisp, chill night air, which was made all the colder by the wind chill as the vehicle took off up the road at a moderately high speed. Jonas was ready to man the large 50 calibre weapon mounted on the vehicle's roof, if the need arose, but everyone hoped that it wouldn't. Since they'd left the campsite, Canute had begun to sound worse and worse over the radio, and the two soldiers couldn't tell how the other nomads were. Many of the vehicles in the caravan were lacking any form of communications with the others. Jonas had hoped that once in bay, he would find more radios for trade with the other survivors, those that were still in the town. But for the time being, he was concentrating on just reaching the hospital before anyone got too much worse. His own eyes were itching, and he could feel his lungs burning. From the driver's seat, Kurt was wheezing as well, punctuating that with occasional, and Jonas thought rather alarming, coughing fits. Jonas's thoughts snapped back to here and now as the headlights illuminated something up ahead, something large and metallic. Uberfeldwebel, Kurt called to his superior. Do you see that? Jonas leaned forward between the front seats to get a better look. I do not like the look of this. Radio Canute and tell him that we have seen. Also, slow us down a little, yeah? He ordered before opening the roof hatch and climbing up to take his position behind the big 50 caliber machine gun. His headset radio was tuned to the same frequency as the main set, letting him listen in to the conversation between his corporal and the caravan leader, Canute. He trained the 50 caliber on the smoking wreckage ahead of them, as Canute gave orders to advance the column no closer than 25 metres from the object, then deploy the first four vehicles in line, with their headlights flooding the area. When the other vehicles stopped behind them, he would order them to turn their lights outwards to watch for any surprises from the sides. Canute would want cover from the 50 caliber whilst he sent a reconnaissance force forward. Jonas knew that. Once the other comms traffic had stopped, the stern German called into his headset. Kurt, when we stop, switch places. You provide cover from the 50. I lead Canute's reconnaissance. Leave the engine running in case we need to make a quick withdrawal. Jawohl, Oberfeldwebel, Kurt barked back. An undercurrent of nervousness was in his voice. By now he could see the wreckage quite clearly and it wasn't one vehicle, but three. The lead vehicle was tracked and armoured. At a glance it could have been mistaken for a tank with a turret-mounted autocannon, but Jonas doubted that it was. Even in the dark, with the smoke and the wreckage being partially mangled, he was certain it was a Stridforden 90, an infantry fighting vehicle used by the Norwegians and the Swedes. The side was mangled, as far as he could tell from here, and the turret sat at a slight angle on its mount. Whatever had hit it, was designed to knock out heavily armoured fighting vehicles, and if that was still in the area, it could certainly do the same to the MRAP, as it had done to the Stridsford 90. Behind the still smoking ruins of the infantry fighting vehicle, lay two more armoured transports. He couldn't make them out clearly enough to be sure, but they looked to him to be like armoured personnel carriers. Just like the lead vehicle, the one in the rear was still belching smoke, albeit a thinner, less dense plume. Nevertheless, Jonas felt certain that whatever had happened here had happened recently, no more than a day or so ago, and probably less. Scattered across the road around the vehicles were small dark forms. There was no mistaking what they were. Lying on the tarmac, where they had fallen, were about a dozen dead bodies. The dead woman had been shot in the neck, the bullet entering from the front and exiting from the back, severing her spinal cord. Death would have been almost instantaneous, Dr. Almandiger observed. The woman wore the battle fatigues of the United Nations counter-alien incursion force, but it was no alien that had shot her. For all the horrors that had poured out of the other verse, no one had yet reported anything able to use more than rudimentary tools, and certainly nothing as advanced as a firearm. The doctor glanced over at the ditch to the right of the road. The fatal shot had come from there. It had to have done. 
Looking back at the body in front of her, she noticed the Norwegian flag beneath the woman's unkirf insignia, and blazoned on her left breast was the rank and name Menig Borgnine. Dr Almandinger closed the soldier's eyes and took her dog tags. She wasn't really sure why, but it seemed to be the right thing to do. With a sigh, she rose and walked to where her nurse, Cherubin Lukuba, knelt over a second body. The giant Congolese man rose as she approached, wiping his bald head with a handkerchief. She noticed that he too had taken the fallen man's dog tags and they hung from his fingers in his left hand. What have we here? she asked. Captain Van Heusen, Norwegian, Uncaif, Cherubin began. He's been shot three times in all, Doctor. The first shot hit him just beneath his armoured vest. He'd have bled to death without medical assistance. The second shot hit his armour, didn't penetrate. The first shot must have hit a weak point because it's gone right through the armoured plate and into his chest, but I can't see an exit wound. I think he died some time later, though, not all at once. He handed the doctor the dog tags taken from the fallen soldier. These were his. I didn't know what to do with them. He trailed off as Dr Armandinger took the proffered tags. I know, Cherubin. I didn't either. She showed him the dog tags that she'd taken from the private. I'll take a look at the third body on the road. Do you want to take a look at the one in the ditch? Jonas had already swept the area for threats before letting the medics expose themselves to any possible danger and reported seeing a body in the ditch there. Cherubin nodded, then trotted over to the ditch. Dropping down at the mud, he began his assessment. Like the others, the soldier wore an uncaif uniform. Cabo Pimo Salapo. Spanish? Cherubin muttered, a little taken aback. The other soldiers had been Norwegian, perhaps just a Spanish name from a family that had settled in Norway, he mused under his breath. He checked the man's arm where he wore the uncaif insignia and the national flag of his country of origin. Cherubin's brow furrowed as he saw the Spanish flag. There was something else that had been troubling him as well, something that he had not at once been able to put his finger on. Now, however, it dawned on him. He stood up slowly and surveyed the scene again. He was right. The man hadn't died assaulting the attacker in the ditch. The man had been firing from the ditch, at the road. Spent shell cases littered the ground all about his feet. It made no sense. Cherubin knelt down once more and checked the body for a cause of death. It didn't take long to find the shrapnel wound that had severed the man's carotid artery. Several more fragments of metal were embedded in his body armour, and more lay scattered about the ditch. That wasn't all, though. The ditch was littered with more spent cartridges and tracks. At least four men had fired from here. Possibly more. Three had left, dragging a body with them. Then he saw it, on the back of the man's neck. Another wound. This one older, all but healed over. Little more than a scar now. A star-shaped scar, just below the ridge of his helmet. Cherubin leaned in to take a closer look. What could have caused this? He muttered to himself. He'd never seen its like before. But what was more puzzling was that it lay directly over the man's spinal column. Surely any wound severe enough to have left such a mark here, where the central nervous system was at its most exposed, would have left the man in no state to continue an act of service. A tight knot began to form in Cherubin's stomach as a theory began to form in his mind. Just a few months ago, he would have laughed at himself for even entertaining it. Of course, a few months ago, he would have laughed at the idea of an alien dimension breaking through to ours. Jonas looked down from the ridge over the scene of carnage behind him. There was no doubt that this was where the shots that destroyed the lead and trailing vehicles had come from. More worrying than that, though, was that there was no doubt in his mind about what had fired at them either. Jonas to Canute, come in, called into his radio headset as he surveyed the trail once again. It wasn't difficult. The ground was heavily churned up, but the vehicle that had done it had left tracks deep enough that the sides came over the top of Jonas's combat boots in places. Canute to Jonas. Go ahead, Jonas. I was right. There were several shooters up here. There are shell casings from multiple small arms, and they didn't take the trouble to hide their tracks at all when they withdrew. That's not the worst of it, though. There are tracks up here that belong to... Hmm. He paused for a second, wincing at the thought of what he was about to tell the old man who had become the caravan's leader. Sighing, he continued. They belonged to a main battle tank.
engine shot. Amber cursed as she peered under the bonnet of the APC. The vehicle had been turned into Swiss cheese by some form of weapons fire. What kind she didn't know and didn't really care either. But she had hoped to salvage the engine at least and to load it onto her wagon. Can you fix it? Father Matthias asked in heavily accented English. No, Father, I mean it's literally shot. About a dozen of these great big things in it. They tore it up quite a lot. She held up a tangled piece of metal, almost the size of her fist, to show the priest. For his part, Father Matthias looked pale, bathed in the glow of the headlights from the caravan's lead vehicles. He gripped his pistol in a double-handed pistol grip and scanned the perimeter for any threats that Jonas and the reconnaissance team might have missed. Not that Ember expected them to have missed anything. She wasn't terribly certain how much security a clergyman with half a magazine of pistol ammunition would be, but she appreciated the gesture. Even if I could get an engine the size of this one out of the housing, with the little gear that I've got, and let's be honest, don't think I could, I doubt it would be worth the effort. It's pretty torn up inside here. Maybe we'd just bleed the diesel out of the fuel tanks and get that bloody great gun off the roof if it still works. The fifty calibre, Father Matthias instinctively corrected her vague categorization of the weapon as a bloody big gun. How do you even know that? As a priest, I mean, Ember asked, wiping her face and succeeding only in smearing oil over her pallid features. I mean, are you really a preacher or some sort of secret special forces agent? Uncertain if it had been a joke or a genuine question, Father Matthias Bussinger laughed. I'm Swiss, he said, as if that alone somehow explained everything. Seeing the confusion in Ember's face, he smiled. National service? I did mine as the padre with a mechanised infantry division. Even padres are expected to at least know what everything's called, he explained. Oh. Ember flushed slightly, embarrassed for her lack of knowledge. Sorry. She shrugged as she wiped her grease-stained hands on an oily rag while stuffing it back into the pockets of her overalls. She set off around the inside of the APC to find a way onto its roof. No need to be sorry, Father Matthias grinned as he followed her. No reason an English woman should know how we do things in this country. You don't have national service in England, I think. Nope, Ember shook her head. Used to, after the Second World War, I think, but not in my lifetime. She stopped, turned, and pointed at the clergyman's automatic pistol. Mind if I ask, Father? Do you think you could use that? You know, if you had to, I mean. I seem to remember that the Bible has something to say about killing. The question sounded a little more impertinent than she'd meant it to. But if he noticed, Father Messiah didn't give any indication of it. You've seen the things that come here from the other verse, my child. I'm not certain God meant those monstrosities when he said it. And if he did, well, I may have some explaining to do when the time comes. Lucky for me, I hear he's a reasonable boss. Ember couldn't help but laugh. She'd never been much one for church. Not that she didn't believe in some form of God. She'd never really stopped long enough to think about it seriously one way or another. But Father Matthias was a long way from the stuffy vicars of the Anglican church that she remembered from her childhood. Well, just so long as you shoot anything trying to eat me, okay? Oh, I'll shoot at it for you. You can count on that. Although I'm sad to say that short of it getting a fright at the loud noise and dying from a heart attack, I'm not sure I'll be able to kill it for you. I never was a very good shot. Oh, great. Thanks, Father. You're a comfort. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. She turned around and began to walk again. As she did, something squelched beneath her heavy work boot. Ugh, she grimaced. Raising her boot to find the eviscerated remains of some large, grub-like thing about the length of her forearm stuck to the bottom of the boot. What's that? she asked, the tone of voice making her disgust clear. There's another one here, Father Matthias said, stooping over the body of the second creature less than a metre from the one ember had trodden on. Don't touch it! Dr. Almandinger's voice was edged with hysteria as she came racing over the tarmac towards them. Cherubin looked Cuba in a wake. His own pistol was in his hand now and pointed at the strange thing on the road. Don't touch it, sir, he yelled. They get into your head. Father Matthias leapt back, just as the thing twitched. Not dead after all, it seemed. With a speed that took the priest by surprise, the thing on the road turned on him. A star-shaped set of mandibles spread out as if to strike. He fired twice, but in his panic the shots simply gouged holes in the road as the grub-like alien monstrosity scuttled towards him. Then stopped. It stopped suddenly, as Ember's heavy boots smashed down on it. The grub burst apart in a shower of pink and green gore. What are they? Ember repeated. I'm not sure, Dr. Armandinger shook her head. 
but I think they might be the reason that two UN units were shooting at each other. With a look of horror in his eyes, Father Matthias pointed down the road. There are more.